welcome to the e padashala the lecture series in uh, for the pg program in computer science uh, i'm rajeshwari sridhar and i'm going to talk about compiler design course uh, where we have divided this course into 40 modules uh, today we will talk about the first module uh, and uh, which will be an introduction to compiler course the main objectives of this particular module are to understand the processes involved in compiler design and uh, to start with uh, we will talk about what is a translator what is a compiler what is its need etc and we'll also try to group them into phases of the compiler so let us go back to some history so where we can define software as an essential component of the current scenario and uh, normally earlier software was written in assembly languages uh, that is uh, you have a mnemonic pseudocode of instructions where uh, the instructions were closer to the machine than to the human being so uh, it was easier for uh, the machine to convert and understand them in a better way but it on the other hand it was very difficult for the programmer to code instructions so therefore what we uh, try to do was basically try to get some coding where we would try to program in a language which is closer to human beings and on the other hand have some kind of a mediator who is going to convert this high level language into a low level language which the machine can basically understand. This is similar to you having a translator uh, where uh, you cannot communicate with another person who does not know your language. So, let us take for example, I am going to uh, talk with a German. So, and I do not know uh, German and he does not know English uh, nor uh, my, native, my uh, local language. In that case, I will have a translator who could understand my local language and convert it into German and then uh, give it to the other person for processing. So, this is what exactly the compiler basically does. So, we are in a position to need uh, where we need a software that will understand human language. So, basically what we define is they are called as language processes where uh, we talked about an example as a translator. A translator is one language processor which essentially converts a source program into an object or otherwise called as a target program source program is what we call as a prog program written in one particular language and we call something as an object program where it belongs to uh, an object language An object language in our context is going to be the machine language that is it is closer to the machine where the machine can basically understand it better and uh, we are going to have uh, the some examples of translators are your assembler your compiler your interpreter etc so, in, our ex in the example which I gave you just now where I am going to have a translator who is going to convert my language into a German language. So, this person is acting like a translator. Okay? So, what is its input? His input is my local language that is I talk to him and then he gets that input. He interprets it. He understands it. So, he is not going to do a literal word by word translation. He could do that also. Rather, he could also convey an essence of what I have basically spoken. So, these are called as language processes. So, what you can uh, basically try doing for uh, our example is you can design an interpreter or a translator to that converts human language to machine language. But uh, what is the difficulty here? You have to parse and uh, you have to get rid of ambiguity here. So, interpreting could basically be ambiguous. So, uh, for on the other hand, supposing say for example, the ex example which I gave you a translator sitting in between um, me and a German speaking person. So, in that case if he tries to if I try to mix up another language which the interpreter also does not understand then it becomes a problem for him to translate to German. So, therefore, what he does is I have to give him input which he can understand and convert it to a German language. So, that is what we are trying to look at it here. So, what we do is we design a compiler that will understand high level that is it need not be a pure English language, but it is somewhat closer to English language where the humans are comfortable in coding and then it is going to convert that to assembly language which the machine can basically understand. This is basically simpler, but it needs a mapping of the high level language to assembly language. So, and then what we can do is we can design an assembler that is going to convert assembly language to machine language. For example, here in the real life scenario, supposing if I am going to use, uh, I am going to mix two languages uh, where I will speak one sentence in one language, the next sentence in another language etc. I could have uh, a, a sequence of interpreters, sequence of translators who could get my language uh, to language X, language X to language Y and language Y could be converted to German by another translator. 
So, this is what we are trying to look do it in the compiler scenario also, where the humans write in a pro language which is closer to English. Okay? This is called as a high level programming language and I have a compiler which is going to convert this language into what is called as an assembly level language. The assembly level language is closer to machine language and then this assembler will take this assembly language as input and convert this into machine language which is going to be consisting of 1s and zeros. So, what is the prerequisite here is the target language need to be specified and the output of the various compilers are to be known prior time. So, this is a sequence of um, uh, processing that could happen. You have a high level language which goes through a, a software system called as preprocessor. The preprocessor basically tries it is something like a fill up the blanks. So, where it is trying to you have what is called as a macros you normally have a hash define you have what is called as a macro which is written in your, uh, your hash include your hash define all these things. All these things will be unstripped and you will convert that into a complete source program and then the source program will be given to the compiler. The compiler will convert this into a target assembly language program. What it should basically get as input is the instruction set should be given to the compiler for generating assembly instructions and then the assembler will basically take this input and convert this into a relocatable machine code which is going to consist of ones and zeros and finally, the linker will link several modules into a single uh, thing and then loads into the main memory for execution that is done by the loader. So, here um, well, let us look at uh, the uh, some history of the compiler where uh, the first real compiler was built um, for Fortran in the late 50s and it required uh, 18 percent years to build. So, uh, what we are trying to look at as a definition of the compiler is it is going to definitely act as a translator transforming human oriented programming languages into computer oriented programming lang oriented machine languages. It does not care about uh, the machine uh, dependency okay? that is not required by I mean the machine dependent details are not required by the programmer. It is up to the compiler to know what is the target machine for it to translate this high level language into assembly language. So, in the process of generating assembly language code the computer the compiler can basically try to generate a pure machine code or an augmented machine code. A pure machine code basically has an instruction set it basically assumes without assuming the existence of an operating system or library it just has an instruction set okay, without uh, no knowledge about the operating system or any library available and uh, it is basically uh, having a most it is basically used for uh, operating systems or embedded applications basically. And the augmented machine code is what we are interested it is code with the operating system routines and runtime support routines. So, that is what we are trying to generate here augmented machine code or a virtual machine code which is not uh, which is not completely in scope with the syllabus, but I am just uh, looking at the types of machine code. The you have uh, virtual instructions which can be run on any architecture with the virtual machine as interpreter or a just in time compiler example is Java basically write once run, run anywhere logic. So, here uh, what happens is the compiler should basically be in a position to process source program, it prompts the error in the source program and it should be in a position to recover or correct the errors and it should produce assembly language program and the assembler takes this assembly language program as input and converts that into a relocatable machine code. So, these are the jobs of a compiler basically okay? and nowadays compilers comes with the assembler and therefore, when you have a source program given as input it is going to convert that into a final machine code consisting of 1s and zeros. So, let us um, uh, look at these two information. The time of conversion from source program into object program is called as the compile time and the object program is executed at runtime. So, we are interested in compilation, but we should also have some knowledge about how memory is going to be allocated, how memory is going to be distributed during runtime when designing a compiler. So, um, interpreter is also a translator, so which is nothing but a language processor that executes the operation as specified in the source program. The typically, inputs are supplied by the user and it processes an internal form of the source program and data at the same time therefore, no object program is generated for an interpreter. So, how do I compile uh, how do I compare compiler and interpreter? Uh, one is a higher degree of machine independence and high portability that is your compiler. 
it has uh, other one is dynamic execution modification or addition to user programs as execution proceeds and dynamic data type is supported the type of the object may change at running run time and it is easier to write so there is no synthesis part which is required and uh, more source text information is basically available with the compiler uh, the machine language target program produced by a compiler is much faster than an interpreter at mapping inputs to outputs so this is one of the uh, fundamental uh, advantage of having a compiler an interpreter on the other hand is better with error diagnostics as it executes the source program statement by statement so with these inter um, understanding we'll just try to get to the overview of the compiler so this is the compilation process as we already know this is the interpretive process uh, process where you have a source program you also have data here in the compile time itself and then it produces the result so you can uh, look at this compiler which is going to analyze the source program the analysis part that is you have analysis part you have uh, what is called as a synthesis part and you also have uh, you could have group your uh, uh, compiler phases into front end and back end so first let us look at the analysis part the analysis part tries to break the source program into constituent pieces and it imposes a grammatical structure on them it then uses this structure to create an intermediate representation of the source program so you can think of this as having two parts the first one is the analysis part the analysis part basically it is going to be language dependent that is the source language dependent and it is target independent that is it need not care till this particular point what target machine code is it trying to look for okay so therefore when you look, given a, give a, give it a source program it is going to break this into small chunks small pieces and then analyze for its correctness and after ensuring it is correct it is trying to put them into a intermediate representation and give it to the next next part of the compilation process that part is called as the synthesis part where given the intermediate representation as input it is going to convert that into a final code depending upon the target machine and uh, in the process what happens is a simple table is getting created okay we'll just go through that in the next few slides the analysis part is often called as the front end of the compiler and the synthesis part is called as the back end of the compiler okay so the front end is nothing but it is trying to break the input program into small pieces of chunks and then based on these chunks it is going to verify whether the chunks are correct correctly organized for grammar etc and grammar and meaning basically and then it is going to convert this into an intermediate representation for at this particular till this particular point of time it doesn't require what is called as the the uh, target machine need not be known till this particular point after that with this intermediate representation in place it is going to convert this into a final machine code based upon the architecture of the machine it is targeting the first four uh, first few parts are called as the analysis part is called as the front end of the compiler and the back end of the compiler basically does the process of synthesizing synthesizing to generate machine code the front end is language dependent and it depends on the source language but it is target independent on the other hand the back end is going to be target dependent and depends on the target language but it's going to be source independent so this is basically what happens source program uh, the analysis has got three phases the synthesis has got basically two phases and the tables are basically a symbol table and a error handler table both are available here so the first the, in the analysis part you have lexical analysis syntactic analysis and semantic analysis lexical analysis basically verifies whether the tokens are correct or incorrect syntactic analysis ensures that whether the tokens are arranged in a correct order or not semantic analysis tells you that whether the types of the tokens are correctly aligned or not on the other hand for the synthesis part so this is going to be an intermediate representation so the edge here corresponds to intermediate representation that is given to the synthesis phase where it generates target code and also optimizes the target code so uh, if you look at the uh, front end grouping back end grouping the analysis grouping based grouping and synthesis based grouping so how many passes uh, should a compiler go through can i map uh, i have here three parts in the analysis phase the two parts in the synthesis um, side and i have one more intermediate representation part 
So, should I go for 6 passes for 1 for each that is going to be a lot of time. So, therefore, what we normally do is we will try to combine some phases into groups and call them as passes. So, the work done by a compiler is typically grouped into phases. Okay. So, this is what we talked about as the phases of the compiler. Lexical phase, syntactic phase, semantic phase, intermediate code generation phase, code optimizers and finally code generators. These 6 phases along with the symbol table and the error handler is going to convert your source program into target assembly language program. Then it is up to the assembler to convert that into machine language finally. So, what happens here is let us go through it uh, sequentially. The first phase is called as the tokenization phase or it is called as a scanner. The lexical analyzer essentially reads the stream of characters in the source program and combines the character into meaningful sequences called as lexeme. Lexeme is nothing but a sequence of characters and for every lexeme the first phase of the compiler essentially produces a token of the form which is passed to the next phase of the compiler. So, this uh, lexeme will have basically a token name and then it is going to have an attribute value. For example, if I consider a statement like int a comma b, okay, a declaration called as int a comma b, here a is a lexeme and the token it gets is going to be called as an identifier. Identifier basically tells you it is a variable. Okay. So, that is one simple example. The token name is normally an abstract symbol which is used during syntax analysis an attribute value is nothing but the points to entry in the symbol table for this token. Blanks will be discarded by the lexical analyzer. Okay. So, you have a token name and an attribute. The token name is nothing but the symbol used during syntax analysis and an attribute is nothing but it's a point, it points to an entry in the symbol table for this particular token. So, uh, you are putting it in a symbol table. right? So, the symbol table id or the symbol table address will basically be point, uh, the attribute it gets. Now, after getting the first phase of the compiler which is the lexical phase which is going to simply scan through the tokens and then get the uh, information about the token name and the attribute value. Now, I have a sequence of tokens after the first phase. Then now my job is to check whether the sequence do they form a meaningful sentence or not. To be very precise, do they form a meaningful statement or not. That is what we are trying to check here. So, it is normally in practice that this lexical phase and syntactic phase go together in a single pass. So, what happens is the like we will see that when we move on to the uh, subsequent chapters though. So, what happens actually is when the lexical phase uh, will uh, give a token to the syntax analysis phase, the syntax analysis phase basically takes this token, checks whether it can manipulate with this token. Okay. If it is not able to proceed further, it is going to ask another token from the lexical phase. So, it is going to um, issue a give token command and uh, the lexical phase will basically uh, give a token. Okay. So, it gives uh, it issues a get token, um, lexical phase will basically give a token to the syntax phase. So, these two phases could basically be grouped into one pass. Okay. So, that is what we are going to look at it later. So, where uh, the second phase essentially what it does is it uses all the tokens given by the lexical phase and tries to form a syntax tree otherwise called as the parse tree or the derivation tree. Okay. The parser uses the tokens produced by the lexer to create a tree like representation that verifies the grammatical structure of the sequence of tokens. Supposing if I have int a comma b semicolon it is a valid statement it is a valid sentence. Okay. If supposing if I give uh, some simply a comma b, a comma b is not a valid statement. Okay. It requires the keyword int before a. Okay. So, it uses the tokens given by the lexer to check whether they form a sensible sentence or a sensible statement. So, this typical representation is a syntax tree in which each interior node represents an operation and the children of the node represent the arguments of the operation. The third phase is the semantic phase of the compiler which is uh, it uses the output of the parser that is the syntax tree 
and the information available in the symbol table to check for semantic consistency in the source program. Type checking basically happens in this phase. Okay, type checking in the sense that it gathers type information and saves it in the symbol table or the syntax tree for subsequent use during code generation. For example, if I want to add two numbers, a is equal to b plus c. Okay, so b should be a if b is an integer and c is also an integer, then a gets the value as an a can be an integer. Okay, supposing b is a floating point number and c is also a floating point number, then uh, a gets the value as a floating point number. On the other hand, if b is a floating point number and c is an integer, in that case what type will I assign it to a? That kind of a type checking basically happens here and it is up to your design, it is your compiler. So, it, you can design it where you could put it as an integer or you can say treat that as a floating point number, it is up to you. So, that kind of type checking basically happens here. Uh, this is what I just now said array index uh, one more thing is uh, another um, few more examples are the array index need to be an integer. Okay, So, for supposing if I say a of 100, so 100 is a integer I am going to, going to check whether this uh, index subscript of an array is going to be an integer or not. If it is floating it should be an error. So, I just throw an error here and I log the error in my error handler. Okay, So, whatever errors basically happens from the first phase till the last phase gets logged into the error handler basically. Okay, And uh, you also do what is called as coercions which is an explicit type conversion Okay, which is an explicit type conversion in the sense that supposing if I give 60 okay, or if I say a into 60 and supposing a is going to be of type uh, float. So, what I am doing is I will convert this 60 into 60.0. So, I will do a into 60.0. So, this is what basically happens as type conversion which is called as coercion. A binary arithmetic operator may be applied to either a pair of integers or to a pair of floating point numbers. If the operator is applied to a floating point number and an integer, the compiler may convert or coerce the integer into a floating point number. So, this is what is called as coercion which is implicit type conversion. And in the fourth phase, the compilers generate an explicit low level or machine like representation of the source program. This intermediate representation should be easy to produce and it should be closer to the target language. Okay. So, this is what is the primary requisite for this particular phase. So, what is its input? Its input is going to be a syntax tree from the third phase of the compiler and the output will be an intermediate representation which is going to be closer to the target code than to the source code. One example is three address code is one type of an intermediate code. Okay. So, where it can have at most three operands and two operators. Out of the two operators one has to be an equal to assignment operator. So, examples are x is equal to y operator z, x is equal to operator y. So, here this is one type of a three address code. So, y, z, x are the three addresses here and this is one operator here and I have an equal to operator also. After uh, intermediate code generation, we can actually go in for what is called as code optimization. You normally try to do an optimization at the intermediate code level itself or you can try to optimize at the final code level. If you try to optimize at the intermediate code level, uh, what happens is this will result in faster, shorter code and it is going to consume less power for the code generation phase. And, um, simple optimizations can basically be applied here itself. Therefore, your code generation complexity also gets reduced, its time also go is going to get reduced if I try to, try to optimize in the intermediate code level itself. And the last phase of the compiler is your code generation phase, where if the target language is machine code, then registers or memory locations are selected for each of the variables used by the program. Then the intermediate instructions are translated into sequences of machine instructions to complete an operation. So, the consideration here are the assignment of registers to hold the variables and the choice of instructions involving registers and memory or a mix of the two is also going to be an another consideration. So, should I put everything into the registers or should I basically try to put some in registers and some in memory and then try to do an operation that is going to be your going to be a uh, point of consideration here. Now, we talked about what is called as a symbol table in the um, phases of the compiler. The symbol table is a hash table like data structure. 
uh, containing a record for each variable name with fields for the attributes of the name. Uh, the data structure is designed to help the compiler identify and fetch the record for each name very quickly. It is also to store or retrieve data from the record very quickly. So, it is basically managed as a hash table which uh, effectively uh, retrieves, stores and um, accesses data at a very, very faster rate. Um, it also interacts with all the compiler's faces. The attributes may provide information about the storage allocated for a name, its type, its scope, function or procedure names, such things as numbers and types of its arguments, the method of passing each argument and the return type is also available in the symbol table. As I already talked about, so these are the phases of the compiler and every time it is going to interact with the symbol table, every phase will interact with the symbol table. So, uh, as I proceed for the next few modules, we will talk about how each uh, uh, module each phases try to tries to act the symbol table will be basically discussed. Uh, here um, we talked about passes against phases. So, several phases can be implemented as a single pass consisting of reading an input file and writing an output file. So, as I already said that it is a multiple pass compiler where the first pass will basically be pre-processing and macro expansion. The second pass will be the syntax directed translation and intermediate code representation. The third pass is optimization and the last pass is going to be code generation. So, what happens here is the first pass is pre-processing and macro expansion. So, the remaining the analysis phase basically happens in one single pass that is verifying whether a particular a token is correct or incorrect, whether a sequence of tokens is going to make meaningful statements and then do I, I mean I will also do type checking there and then convert into a syntax tree representation and then generate intermediate code for the same. Intermediate code is what we talked about as three address code there. So, from the lexical phase till the three address code, it is going to be one single pass and then optimization is going to take another pass and finally, code generation is going to take the last pass. This is just one way. So, you can basically try to do it in another uh, way also uh, where uh, we looked at the examples earlier. And one more thing which I wanted to talk about here is uh, when we looked at um, the uh, error handler, the error handler basically is going to interact again with all the phases of the compiler where the error handler whatever errors you encounter will be logged into the error handler from every phase. And then it allows the compiler to continue with its remaining compilation process and then finally, when it uh, lands up in a um, problem, it can recover from the errors based by looking at looking into the error handler and the error handler will basically be prompted to the user for correction by the user for proceeding with for the for actual uh, for the next uh, comp for subsequent compilation iterations. So, um, to summarize this basically, we have seen the phases of the compiler where we looked at uh, six phases lexical, syntax, semantics, intermediate code generation, code generation and finally, code optimization. We also talked about the need for an error handler and the symbol table and we also talked about translators here where uh, we looked at interpreter and translator as two inputs. So, with that um, we have seen the phase of the compiler. Uh, now, we will take an example and discuss that uh, in the uh, next uh, module.